Well, hello there, and welcome to another episode of Warbird Wednesday. My name is Fred Bell. I am the vice chairman of the Palm Springs Air Museum. Due to the Josh Gates incident, that's what we're calling it now, of the escalation, we, Greg has gone out and upped our production value quite a bit. He's now making sure that I am properly togged in wardrobe, and if you'll notice, we're taking the entire pirate theme all the way through, right, Greg? Isn't it good? Yes. So we're, we're doing that, you'll notice. Uh, I am actually the gratuitous product placement. We will talk about that in a little while. But first, Greg, the parsimonious, Greg. Why do you pick a word that I can barely pronounce? Parsimonious. All right, very good. The uh, parsimonious Greg has asked that I tell a joke, Greg. What's a joke? The joke is, why are pirates pirates? Because they are. Oh, okay, there you go. Greg is rolling his eyes. Okay, well, I threw it out there. It says, as I said, be kind to your wait staff. I'm here all week. I am going to obviously lose the pirate togs. We're out on the ramp today, and we thought we would do something a little bit interesting, a little bit different. There's a toss and the eyepiece. He goes for the save. All right, so we're going to do something a little bit different, and that is we're going to take you behind the scenes. You get to see the airplanes when they're done. You've seen a bunch of them that we've restored, but you've never seen anything in process. And the aircraft that we're going to do today is one that is in process. This is the LTV Vought Corsair II, the A7. How do you like that? Now, the A7 was an attack aircraft. By the way, A is for attack and F is for fighter. If you're going into Navy airplanes, this particular aircraft was built under a... Uh, request, a design request by the Navy in the early 60s for an attack airplane. They actually were looking for something that was going to replace the A-4 Skyhawk, if you can believe that. I, I was kind of surprised by that. The A-7 was the follow-on airplane. The military does that. They go out uh, quite a ways. Now, the A-4 stayed in production into the 70s, so who knew that that was going to happen? But they uh, went ahead with this design anyways. Now, this particular airplane, I say this all the time, but this airplane is uh, quite the innovator. A couple of innovator innovations that I'm going to cover here. But it, um, it came into service. It actually flew in the mid-60s. It came into service with the fleet in the late 60s. And it served up until the 90s, the early 90s. Now, the interesting thing about this is that this is a crossover airplane. It not only flew for the U.S. Navy, it also flew for the United States Air Force. And I'll get into what everybody used it. But as an attack aircraft, what the Navy was looking for something that had more payload, could carry more bombs, and had more range. And that is where this airplane came in. It could carry about 16,000 pounds of bombs it, which meant it could carry about twice the bomb load of an A4, or it could carry the same bomb load twice as far. Think about that, Greg. Isn't that confusing? That's a confusing fact, but what the heck? It is a Fred fun fact. So that was the design. Now, this aircraft, this particular aircraft, is an A7A. This is the first of the type, or the first of the, the, the type of airplane that came in. There were a lot of innovations in this airplane, a lot of variants. This aircraft actually had a long lifespan in the service of other countries. This airplane served out into the Greek Air Force until 2014 when it was finally retired, if you can believe that. This is Sparta. Greg, do you know the Spartans had A7s? Isn't that interesting? Greg is smiling. He enjoyed that. But this is the first of the type. Now, how can you tell this is the first of the type? First of all, this is a dead giveaway. And what is that? That's a cannon. The early versions of this airplane had two cannons on either side, carried about 250 rounds per cannon. The rest of them, uh, the rest of the variants later, went to another uh, very familiar suspect. We're going to talk about a lot of familiar suspects today, but this particular uh, airplane on its armament actually went to a Gatling gun, Greg, later went to a 20 millimeter Gatling gun, but in the early versions it actually just had a, a cannon, a 20 millimeter cannon on either side. Now, there's a thing on this airplane, as we restore these airplanes, you can see they're actually starting 
to make the skin repairs. A lot of what happens when these airplanes are retired is that they go to AMARG, they go over to Tucson to the airplane boneyard, and there they're either reclaimed. Think about this, it's like the military's pick apart, Greg. You basically go and they take parts off of them, and in this case, if they're in foreign service, they would strip parts off these airplanes to keep the other fleet going. By the way, there are a little over 1,500 of these airplanes made in all variants. And there was also, I'm going to tell you about an interesting effort to extend the life on this airplane towards the end. But this, if it went to the regeneration facility in Tucson, when, when do you, uh, what, what's a dead, uh, dead giveaway, Greg? Tell me a dead giveaway on this. Do you know what it is? Greg is looking. It's that right there. You see that cross? That is a dead giveaway. When I go out and look at airplanes, by the way, I never like to see an airplane like this, especially an airplane that is significant. There, as I said, there are only about 200 of this type made. This is the introductory version. But when you see them like this, it makes me kind of sad, Greg. It makes me just a wee bit sad because this airplane had a long lifespan. In this case, it's actually a celebrity. We're gonna talk about that a little bit. But uh, it's been kind of picked over and destroyed and what we have to do here to get it back, this, by the way, the museum owns this airplane, and it will go back into our fleet as a static display. It will not fly. But uh, we, I hate to see airplanes like this because they're, they, they're just, there's no sense of history. They're kind of destroyed. And in this case, this airplane had gone to the boneyard and then was disposed of. We found it in a yard. Greg can throw up some pictures on that, but it was in a, in a yard uh, in a very, very bad condition. But any time I go out and I look at airplanes, one of the things I try to figure out, especially if they're Navy aircraft, is did they go through the boneyard? And the, this one did, it was sold as surplus, and that's how we, ended up, how we ended up owning it. But we're in the process of repairing it. So the A7 is an interesting airplane in that, use that term again, parsimonious, Greg, interesting. It is interesting and it is groundbreaking. Now, Greg is saying, why is it groundbreaking? Well, it's groundbreaking for a couple of reasons. One, this was the first aircraft to ever have a HUD in it, Greg. Do you know what a HUD is? Greg doesn't know what a HUD is. A heads-up display. The pilot had a heads-up display up in that cockpit, and that projected an image out in front of him with all kinds of information, navigation, targets. It was the first airplane, and the heads-up is literally what it means. Rather than looking at displays down in the aircraft, which a lot of the earlier airplanes did. You're looking at gauges and screens and everything else. The, this airplane was the first one to have a heads-up display. Greg, it also, another interesting thing, is that this was the first airplane to have an integrated data link. I'm talking about stuff that's really exciting today. People are at home, the hair is standing up in their arms right now. Integrated data link. That excites people. Doesn't it, Greg? Parsimonious, Greg? And why did it have an integrated data link? Well, it was one of the first airplanes, it was the first airplane that could do a hands-free landing, theoretically, although I would not recommend you do that. All the airplanes now have a hands-free landing system on an aircraft carrier. In other words, there we go, one of our fine jets coming in, because we're outside. He's probably completely losing my audio, but we'll let him land and get by. But uh, it had a data link so it could land hands-free on the aircraft carrier. Now, Greg, I'm going to go over here. I'm going to get my model. We can do, there's a plan view on the airplane. Now, this aircraft, as I said, it had an integrated data link. It had a heads-up display. The early versions of the aircraft had a cannon. The uh, later versions had a, uh, um, a um, Gatling gun. So the interesting thing about this airplane and its design, although it's a derivative of the F-8, it did not have the F-8's variable incidence wing. To the young man at home, I want you to go out and look at that wing and learn how that wing works. Variable incident wing is a very interesting and an interesting design. This aircraft in the early versions was uh, underpowered. The, the A models were underpowered. It wasn't later until the D and the E and a little bit later that they solved some of those problems. It also, for you pilots, was squirrely in high crosswind landings. They had some challenge with, with it with high crosswind landings. And pilots had trouble with it on the decks of carriers, the early versions, because of braking on wet decks. It was not a great uh, wet deck grip breaker, Greg. 
that's kind of an interesting term, a wet deck, deck breaker. Say that fast, parsimonious, Greg. So uh, those were really the kind of the, the squirrely versions of it. They, they extended the airplane. They made it uh, a little bit bigger. They changed it and went into Air Force service as a strike fighter. And um, it was the versions of this airplane were all subsonic up until one that I'm going to tell you about. They made an interesting change in this airplane as they were trying to modify it to a deep strike fighter really late in its career. But this aircraft flew top speed. It was subsonic at about 690 miles an hour, give or take. Uh, geometry on the airplane, if you look at it compared to, let's say, the MiG-15 or the MiG-17, very similar. Now, Greg, this airplane had a, had a nickname. Do you want to know what it was? You want to know what it was, Craig? It was Short Little Ugly Fellow. Slough. Now, there was Short Little Ugly Fellow. There was another term. This is a G-rated show. We're not going to get into that. But it was the Short Little Ugly Fellow, as far as we're concerned, because it is very short, and it's got a very short wingspan. But it packed a really, really big punch. Now, the Air Force went on to use it. It also, usual suspect here, Greg, usual suspect. We have an airplane that keeps popping up in all of this. What did the Air Force use this for? Little known fact, they used it for training, for um, currency training and chase aircraft for another very elusive airplane, a very elusive airplane that we're going to be getting in September. What was it, Greg? The F-117A, these flew out of Tonopah, so the Air Force pilots were flying these. They flew them because the later versions had a similar flight envelope to the F-117, and uh, they flew them all the way up. The other thing they were doing is they were, besides there was an operation to use captured Russian MiGs uh, against uh, in aggressor squadrons, and they were up at Tonopah, Nevada as well. But these aircraft were up there as well, and the bogus reason they were supposed to be up there is they were supposed to be using them for radar cross-section training. Did you know that, Greg? Greg, you weren't part of radar cross-section training? I thought you flew the 104, too. I'm, like, building you up. Yeah, 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 he's giving me that. So, so they, they flew with the Air Force up to that point. Now, one of the things we're going to do today is we are going to give Greg the opportunity to stretch his prover proverbial production teeth, parsimonious Greg. Josh Gates, we are upping the game, not only in wardrobe, but we're going to do our beaming. We're going to beam in and out here. So, Greg, engage. And we're back. You know, as we were talking about, we're going to restore that A7. And it'll eventually go out on the line. One of the things that's exciting about the Air Museum, and why, why we wanted to take you behind the scenes, is we have a complete rework facility that we put all these airplanes through. And this is truly behind the scenes. Behind me is our metal shop and what we can do with these airplanes. Many times when these airplanes are reclaimed, especially uh, when they come in from some of these military boneyards and they've been picked over, there are parts that you just can't get. They're, they're gone. And Greg can throw up some images like of the F-102 and some work we've done on some of these airplanes. But in some of these restorations, we've literally had to reskin the airplane or rebuild the airplane or not had a hat where the helicopter rotor is attached to, things that, that you just can't get. In those cases, we have to manufacture that stuff, and we do a lot of that. We have the ability to have uh, computerized uh, cutting and lathes and all kinds of, if we can get it in CAD, in computer-assisted design, we can pretty much make it and put it on the airplane. And you can see, like, we can make precision parts down to these types of things in just a few minutes if we have the ability to know what the part looked like. And in some cases, we actually have to go out and shoot the part with a 3D camera to get all these dimensions to the part so we can put it into the computer and then essentially remanufacture it for the airplane. Now, there's one thing that we do not do. We fly our fleet or a portion of our fleet. We do not make aviation-ready parts. We go out and buy those parts either from the original manufacturer or somebody that is licensed to, to make that stuff. But we do not make parts for flying airplanes, only for static aircraft. So you can look all the way through here. Now, the, the artisans that we have that work in here, the people that work in here, come from all walks of life. They could be retired machinists from Boeing, 
We have some people who are literally rocket scientists that work in here. And we, we even have somebody that worked on the Apollo space program that's in this area. Now, to give you an idea of what in our rework facility right now, we actually have a Catalina, which you may have been able to see in that shot. That, I would equivalent, uh, have the equivalent of being of restoring a condominium. That's probably about the closest thing. It's a very big airplane. That aircraft will eventually go back into flight. We have, the, uh, the predator, we have a Predator drone, an MQ-1 on the ramp, aptly in its casket, which is actually what it's called. That's a remotely uh, piloted uh, vehicle, the Predator, very well known. And we have the A-7, and then of course we talked about the F-117. So Greg can get a, a shot of all this stuff and do some pickup work on it. Now, one thing for my stage two today as we're filming this, I want to give a shout out to all of those fire crews that are working on that. Right now we've got a Navy helicopter carrier, the uh, Bonhomme Richard, that is actually burning not too far from us down in uh, San Diego uh, Harbor there at the Navy base. God bless you firefighters. Keep working on that ship. Get that fire out. Uh, we wish all the best to the Navy on that. That's a terrible thing anytime you have a fire on board a ship. So to all you Navy guys out there, especially you damage control crews and you firefighters, God bless you. Now Greg with a, went with a little bit different thing today. This is Anchor Ginger Root Beer. Anchor Ginger Root Beer is not a sponsor. Did you know that? Parsimonious Greg? They are not a sponsor. They are a soothing beverage for the traveler. Hmm. But they do have the anchor, keeping with our Navy pirate theme today, so Greg chose that. Uh, let's see. Greg, you're continuing to try to, maybe that's your, your angle now, is not to poison me with oddly covered drink, colored drinks, but to just uh, give me so many uh, grams of sugar that I drop into a diabetic coma. This has 170 calories. Uh, is actually not bad. I don't see you know, I've gone to, since uh, the poisoning incident, I've gone to the expiration date on these things, but I don't see one. But it's actually not bad, Greg. You're on a roll here. Mm. So again, to all you, um, you Navy guys down there, and especially those firefighters, God bless you and, and good luck with that. And with that, why don't we move out of our shop here. Greg can get a couple of other images. We're going to go back to the A7. Greg, engage. And we're back. Greg, another great job on the gratuitous visual effects. So we're back with the A7 after coming out of our shop. Now this airplane had a, a little bit of an interesting life beyond the F-117. There was actually an effort to give this life after it went out of the Air Force inventory. Did you know that, Greg? 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 Got your, we've got the Greg counter. That's probably like 400 Gregs by now. But the, um, there was actually two prototypes built of this airplane that the fuselage is extended. They put a bigger, the TF-41 engine that they put in, the later types in this solved the underpowered issue that I mentioned. They were having compressor stall problems. The TF-41 engine in the later models solved all of those, was a very reliable engine, but they actually went back and took two of these airplanes in the late 80s and the early 90s, they extended them, they put a bigger engine in it, and they called it a strike fighter, it was a strike a, uh, A7, and they, uh, it could go up to, do you know this Greg, Mach 1.2, it actually was supersonic, they built two of them, one of them is at Hill I believe, the prototype, and the other one is at Edwards Air Force Base. If you guys ever want to give those up, we'd love to have one down here. But the, uh, not going to happen, but you know, we would, we can't, we have to ask, Greg, right, right? If you don't ask, you don't get. So um, they were doing this, but what happened with this airplane? What happened with the prototypes? What was it up against, Greg? The F-16. The F-16, the Air National Guard units wanted that F-16 pretty bad at that time. Remember, we're talking early 90s. And they, although there were a bunch of these sitting around that they could have repurposed and re-engined, they decided not to go with that and the program was parked. But after the, the prototype aircraft on the strike fighter, this airplane kind of died out with the exception of its uh, activity in um, foreign service when it flew for those foreign air forces like I talked about up until 2014. Now, the interesting thing is, 
Greg, this airplane is also a star. Did you know that? And this is going to be our, Greg is going to throw this up, our gratuitous product placement. This aircraft is a subject of a model. This specific airplane in VA-56 colors, the boomerangs, and that they flew off, uh, the colors that she's in flew off the Midway, another familiar subject, in the mid-70s. We have that. It's a Hasegawa kit and it's actually this specific airplane. So Greg will throw that up. You can go out to the site, you get yourself, if you're a modeler, wouldn't it make your collection to have one of these A7s? And you can actually go out and see the real thing because we're gonna put it back into the colors that she was in on that kit. But that also goes to show you about how, uh, as far as preservation with these later jet airplanes, there's not a lot of rhyme or reason, unless they're like a one-off airplane. They just don't end up in museums and they end up going to boneyards. This particular airplane, as I said, a little bit of a movie star, still went to the boneyard, still got picked apart, and we were really fortunate to be able to save it. So hopefully in about a year, you're gonna be able to see this thing uh, restored and back on the line. She will be a static display airplane. It will not fly. This is not an airplane that we'll bring into the fleet but you will be able to see it in all its glory. But go out to that website, uh, to our merchandise store, and you can pick it up. Remember, remember, we are getting close to what milestone, Greg? What milestone? A thousand subscribers on our uh, YouTube channel. Really important, we wanna get there. If you know somebody, send them this link, hit that subscribe button, tell them to go out and subscribe. It will make your day, it will make you happier, you will grow two inches taller and be 10 miles an hour faster. None of that will happen, but you will subscribe to the channel. So is that, is that my cover on false advertising, Greg? So remember, smash that subscribe button. If you see us on Facebook, like us, or on Instagram, uh, some of our other social feeds. And uh, if you also, I have, we actually, Greg, two, two product placements today. If you like this Air Pirate shirt, I will turn around. Greg, the parsimonious, did you get that? Or should I turn around and hold a little longer? You're good, Greg says he's good. Uh, you go out to the site and get the shirt as well. And you need the shirt. Remember, when it's 129 degrees out, what you want to be wearing is black. Just wear it like that. In Palm Springs right now, it is just hot. Am I right, Greg? In fact, my ginger beer is boiling. So with that, we are going to wrap up another Warbird Wednesdays. My name is Fred Bell. Remember, smash that subscribe button, like us on Facebook. Thank you very much. Have a great day.